We are getting into the short rows of our Sermon on the Mount series. Uh, we have just a few more sermons. In fact, the last sermon on this particular uh, text will be uh, the first Sunday of July. <clears throat> and so over the next few weeks, um, we will see Jesus use two gates. He will use two trees and he will use two soils. And in this sermon, everything has led up to this point. As, as he is teaching, as he is preaching, he is talking about being a citizen, being a part of the family of God. And those that aren't living into, aren't part of this kingdom part of the inheritance of eternal life that Jesus has been talking about, they remain citizens of the fallen world. And they will be judged. And unless they have come to faith in Jesus Christ, that's eternal damnation, as Scripture calls hell. The way to life is on God's terms, and it's on God's terms alone. The way that leads to destruction is on anyone's terms, if they so choose themselves. But God's way is the only way. He has given us, Jesus has given us the standards throughout this sermon. He has talked about what it means to be righteous or self-righteous. He has talked to us about being sufficient in the Lord or self-sufficient depending on our own actions. He's talked about hypocritical standards and he has certainly talked about the scribes and the Pharisees, using them as examples throughout this sermon. And so, like it or not, in the text today, there are two gates, two ways, and which way you choose is very, very important. Our nation today seems to be a nation that has um, this promotes this idea of choices, uh, and it's, it's really lifting it up as some of the highest value that, that we live in, this idea that um, we get to choose everything in any way that we choose. But I will tell you, this idea has grave consequences. Society has used this foundation to justify sinful practices, and Americans tend to think that they are free to make any choice that they want to make. In fact, I would say that as individuals, choices that are being made in our nation today um, will have an impact on the rest of society. And often society is left to pick up the bill. And I'll give you a few examples. There are advocates for legalization of drugs, and the legal legalization of drugs affects not only that person that is taking drugs, but it affects all of society. The defense of pornography, the justification of gambling, and then the right of choice, uh, many call it, has killed 35 million babies to date since 1973. Choice. We lift it up. Today, it's in the headlines when it comes to sexuality and everything else that, wants, that people want to promote as my right to do whatever I please. And many decisions are trivial and infinite, insignificant, and, and we know that. But there are many decisions that are essential, and they are life-changing. And I would say today's text is one of those texts that this decision to follow Christ is so important that it is crucial 
to the point of there's only two ways and there's only one choice that ultimately is made. And the decision that we make to follow Christ has to be in perfect harmony to God's absolute sovereignty. So hear me, church. God is the one that does the saving. God is the one that does the calling. Without God's call, the scripture tells us, we would not respond to him. So that call is from God. He is the one call, has called and is calling. His sovereignty in this sermon or in this text is not up for question. It is not up for debate. Debate. But, hear me church, we have a place in salvation. We have a part to play in salvation. You know the scripture. We went through it a year or so ago. But you need to hear it again. We all need to hear it again. Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. And with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. This is our part. Is God sovereign? Absolutely. God is the one that calls us. But we don't sit back and do nothing. It's the same thing we do with Matthew 28. We go and share the good news because we don't know who God is calling and he calls us to share. So please hear this sermon today. It might be that you say, well, why would I worry about this when I am saved? I have entered through the narrow door. Well, what if someone comes to you and says, I've, I heard somebody talk about two doors. Jesus said, I am the gate or the door. Could you explain what the meaning is? I think this text has something for all of us today. If you have your Bibles and you want to follow along, it's just two verses. It's in Matthew 7, verse 13 and 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who will enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Let's pray. Father, may the words of my mouth and meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. I pray, Father, that you would illuminate our hearts and minds today for what you would have through this, your holy word. We pray this in your name. Amen. I want you to get this picture, and um, I was trying to find a, a picture, and, and this actually works as far as two way, which way to heaven? And, and you might be asked at some point, which way is it to heaven? And so I want you to get this picture in your mind of a way that there are a, a number that are going, and there's a way that a, only a, a few are going. And so you have the, the narrow way, and you have the broad way. That, that narrow gate, that narrow way, has a, a person at, at the entrance, and that person's going to have scars on their head. They're going to have scars on their hands and scars on their feet, and, and they're going to, to greet you there as someone that is coming to faith, and that is Jesus Christ. And, and so if someone comes to Jesus, there are going to be some that will be turned away because they don't know him, and more importantly, he doesn't know them. And there's some that, that never approach that gate with the man with the scars who gave his life for them. 
Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. The other gate is, is very wide. In fact, uh, the orchestrator of this gate has not just one sign over it that says, enter through me like Jesus. This gate has many signs. It's got someone that is in a, a robe and says, the intelligent inner here, if you can think with your mind and, and get rid of all that other stuff, that fake stuff, false stuff, just enter through my gate. There's another person that's standing there and says, oh, enter through my gate and you have nirvana. You can have anything you want. This is where all of anything that you desire can take place. There are those that would stand there in perfect, beautiful clothes, beauty, and say, oh, here's the way to self-fulfillment. Just come through my area, area of the wide gate. And then there are those that are standing in their religious garb. And they say, Allah says, come through here. Many different ways. Many different opportunities. Many different avenues. Jesus calls it the broad path, this broad way. And as we're going into this wide and broad path, we can't see what's down the road. We know it's broad. We know there's a lot of people there. We, we can't see beyond the crowd that is there. But I would tell you that if you look down that narrow path, you may not see what is actually at the end of that path yet either. As we are standing and looking at the paths, I'm sure that there are probably those, and we have heard it ourselves maybe in our walk with Christ, where there are those of these various groups that say, I can't believe you believe that, or they joke or they laugh at you because of your faith in Jesus Christ, your walk with him. They cannot believe you wouldn't choose what, in essence, this world says would make you happy. This narrow gate, as we see it, and as we look into it, it doesn't seem to be as smooth as the other path. That wide path seems to be quite smooth, quite enjoyable. But the narrow path seems to be rocky, difficult at times. The great thing is this. Because we live when we live and we have what we have in Scripture, we do know that we can see down the road. We, we may not see the end, and our life is before us, and some of our lives are a little bit closer maybe to the end than others of you, but we don't know when any of us will face that end of life or Christ will come back. But we have the story, and we know the end of the story. We know what is in at the end of each of the paths because God has given us that direction. And so the question was only which path, which gate will we go through? The choice seems easy, right? You've got heaven down one way, and we know that hell's down the other. We know that Jesus gave his life that we could enter the narrow gate. We know that Satan bids us in our fallen nature to come through the wide gate. The problem with most today is they do not look at the final destination as a problem. In fact, most people today, even those in the church, don't think about the final destination. 
we're not looking at where the path leads. We're looking at the moment in most cases. We're not looking at the man who has scars. We're looking at the person in Satan that is saying, here's the fun-loving, this is the beautiful, this is the intelligent, this is the broad path. Why don't you come to the smooth gate? People do not like the doctrine of hell, I have found out. Um, anytime that in, in ministry that I have preached on hell, um, someone would, I, inevitably somebody comes up to me and says, why don't you preach on love instead of hell? You know, I don't like that. I don't like to hear about God being a God of judgment or damnation. Well, you know, <laughs> the doctrine of hell is biblical. Uh, it, it's in Scripture. It is truth. Uh, it is a message that God has given us. And Jesus uses a word here in destruction that people take out of context. So what many that don't like this doctrine of judgment or hell, what they do is take this word destruction and say, oh, that means that you will be annihilated or you cease to exist. And that's not what the Greek word means here. Because you see, if those who take the broad path are annihilated or it cease to exist, there is no judgment. There is no as Jesus calls it, eternal fire that is unquenchable. The word here means total ruin or loss, not annihilation. And so the wide gate leads to a broad path that leads to destruction. Scriptures are very clear. John the Baptist, Matthew 3 as for me, I baptize with water for repentance, but he is coming after me mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. I will, he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire, and his wintering fork is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor, and he will gather his wheat into the barn, and he will burn up the chaff with an unquenchable fire. Unquenchable is everlasting is not ending paul writes in second thessalonians 1 9 and these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction and there we see that word again eternal ruin eternal loss and listen to what paul says away from the presence of the lord and from the glory of his power and so damnation is the separation from God, being totally separated, never again for all eternity being in the presence of the Lord. But maybe Jesus said it more clearly than anyone else besides Matthew or Paul. Or Paul. In Matthew 25, Jesus says this, Depart from me, accused ones, into eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Heaven is real. Hell is too. Because if hell is not real, heaven's not. The wide gate leads to the broad way that leads all to hell. So who is on it? Everyone that's not gone through the narrow gate. You see, everyone is on the path. Everyone is on that path until they go through the narrow gate. There's only two ways, though there are those that claim that there are many ways. It's not the case. Jesus says, I am the only way, and there is no other. It's the only biblical truth that we, it's the biblical truth that we have that leads to heaven, that all other paths lead to hell. 
biblical Christianity is a religion of divine accomplishments. Our salvation depends on the work of God. It's not our work. True Christianity relies on the righteousness of God being imparted into us as believers. We are offered grace and mercy through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is the righteousness that comes from God for every person. Every other religion depends on some human effort. not Christianity. We are to humble ourselves before the Lord, acknowledge our sin before the Lord, confess, and we are to repent and accept him as Lord and Savior. Jesus makes this contrast as he's ending this sermon about the, the grace that comes through God and that of man's works. Between a religion of faith and a religion of of flesh, between righteousness of the heart that is internal in us, internal, or the hypocritical self-righteousness that's often displayed externally. The scribes and the Pharisees Jesus used over and over as they were far from God because they trusted in their own ways and not God's. John MacArthur puts these two paths this way, and I think it's helpful for us to hear. He says, and I quote, there have always been two systems of religion in the world. One is God's system of divine accomplishment. The other is the man's system of human achievement. One is the religion of God's grace. The other is the religion of man's works. One is the religion of faith. The other is the religion of of flesh. One is the religion of a sincere heart. The other is a religion of hypocrisy. Within man's system are thousands of religious forms and names, but they are all built on achievements of man and inspiration of Satan. Christianity, on the other hand, is a religion of divine accomplishments, and it stands alone in Christ, end quote. So the way is broad when it comes to the world and Satan. What about the narrow way? How does one enter the narrow gate? Well, again, let me remind you that everyone is on this wide path that leads to destruction, and we are called and are wooed by God to come to this narrow gate. And in reality, to walk through the narrow gate means to respond to God. We would never respond on our own. Scripture is clear on that. Romans 3.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of eternal life is through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6.23, we, are like, we, are, we um, have all sinned and um, have eternal life through Jesus. Isaiah 53, all are like sheep who have gone astray everyone turning to their own way. And then Romans 3.12, there is no, there's nothing good in any of us. And so we would not seek to go through the narrow gate on our own. It was a, a call. It is a, a wooing by God. And, and Jesus in verse 13 begins this and says, enter through the narrow gate. Take that step. Obey, and that first step that we have to take is confession and repentance. We have to change our mindset and go in a different direction. Confession and repentance, changing our mindset and direction. And let me give you an illustration of that. 
let's say that you are leaving Raleigh and you jump on 95 and, and you're heading down to Florida, maybe to Orlando uh, to go to Disney World. And somewhere along the way, your phone rings and it's your boss. <clears throat> and your boss says, you need to turn around and go to Washington. We've got a dire situation. And you on the phone tell your boss, absolutely, I hear what you're saying. Yes, I'll turn around and go to Washington. The other direction on I-95 will take you to Washington. You hang up the phone and you continue to drive and you pass an exit and you pass the next exit and you pass the next exit. Now, you can say to yourself that you changed your mind in going to Orlando. You told your boss you were going to go to Washington and turn around. But you did not change your mind if you end up in Orlando. You never changed the direction that you were going. And so for us to, to change our mind about going into the wide gate and going into the narrow gate means that we have to change our direction. We have to repent, confess and repent to go through that narrow gate. And the gate is narrow. It's like a turnstile. The entrance is individual. In other words, there is no family. There is no spouse. There is no one else in your relationship that you can walk into that gate with. In other words, this is on you. That's why it's called a personal relationship with Christ. I can't walk in behind Terry. I have to walk and confront Christ myself with who I am. It's not your heritage. It's not your color. It's not your background. It's your relationship with Jesus. As Jesus greets us at that narrow gate individually, he knows our heart. He knows us, who we are, and have we confessed and repented and accepted him as Lord? He knows. The narrow gate is also where you can bring no baggage. Matthew 16 says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life must lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake shall find it. You see, as we enter through this turnstile, as we enter individually through this narrow gate, as we confront our Lord and Savior, we are stripped down. There is nothing that we can take in with us except our relationship with Christ. When Christ talks about being crucified with him, think about that just for a second. Crucifixion, they were stripped. They would lay bare. And Christ calls us to be laid bare, to humble ourselves to the point that we have laid everything else aside. There is no baggage. It's kind of like the, the penitent tax collector that cried out, God, be merciful me to me, a sinner. In other words, Father, here I am. I am a sinner. I lay bare everything in my soul, everything that I am before you, because I know that any self-righteousness or pride or any hypocritical stance that I have or any false pretense that I believe is not acceptable in your eyes. We walk through that gate stripped and laid bare before our God. And the great thing is this. By doing so, God the Father sees us through his son's eyes as righteous and whole. How about that? That God the Father sees us righteous and whole through his son, our Savior. 
this is absolutely the work of Jesus. We enter it because of grace, not because of anything that we have done or anything on our behalf of earning it in any way. We are justified through faith, grace through faith, through Jesus Christ. The way is narrow. The gate is narrow. The path is difficult. When, when we offer Christ, when we proclaim the good news of the Savior, for us to say, if you just come to faith in Jesus Christ and everything will be okay, is just not right because it's going to be difficult. There are going to be difficult ways. It's not easy on this path that leads to eternal life. Jesus says you will have tribulation and persecution. You will have heartache. You will face difficulty. The world will hate you because of me. But he says rejoice because I have conquered the world. And so the, the gate is not just small, but it's narrow. And it's not just narrow, but Jesus tells us few will find it. And, and that's difficult for us because there are those that say that they are Christian. Oh, I raised my hand at a, a, when an evangelist said, if you want to give your life to the Lord, I raised my hand. Or I prayed a sinner's prayer with someone. That's great. And in many cases, that may have absolutely been the time that you gave your life to Christ. But I will tell you, there are many that raise their hand or say a sinner's prayer that have never, ever committed their life to Christ. Jesus says there are few, few that will find it. Luke 13, 23 and 24 and someone said to him, being Jesus, Lord, are there just a few who are being saved? And he said to them, strive to enter by the narrow door, or you could put gate there, either one. Jesus said, I am the, the gate, I am the door. Strive to enter through the narrow door, for many, I tell you, will seek to enter it and will not be able. There are many that say that they're a Christian, but they have never surrendered their life to Christ. Someone has told them that they can live however they want and just believe that Jesus is Jesus, but you get to do anything you want, and they have never surrendered their life to Christ. They have never followed his commandments. They have never obeyed his standards. And we'll look at what true fruit looks like next week. Jesus gives this command, calls us. He, he begins this very passage, enter, enter. He is calling us to enter. He came to seek and save the lost. The scripture tells us that God tarries because he doesn't wish that anyone would be lost. It does not surplant the sovereignty of God, that God is all-knowing, that God calls us. But we have a response to make, and that is to confess and repent and follow him. So what does this say to us today? What does this have to do with us who are believers who have walked through that that door, that gate, that we have surrendered our life and we are following Christ and, and we believe in him and we trust in him and we know what the destination is. If I die today, y'all celebrate because I'm going to bust heaven wide open. We are to be prepared 
And there's many today that aren't. Many that do not believe that there's more than just this life and we're done. There are many who live as the scribes and Pharisees that are listening to Jesus preach. There are many that do not know the way to heaven, that do not know Jesus. Many of us have family, friends, who are on the broad path. And many of us know those that don't want to hear or listen to what we have to say. But I want to tell you, pray. Pray for those that you know and love that aren't following Christ, have never surrendered. Don't be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't be ashamed to live how God has called you to live, to proclaim his word and pray. I pray every day for those that are lost, some in my own family, that is Let's not surrender to the Lord. You may say, interesting sermon, I'm on the right path, and I'll give thanks for that. But someone at some point is going to ask you if they haven't already. As you live out your life before others which way is it to heaven will you have an answer for them there's only one way and it's Jesus thanks be to God Father we look at these two gates, these two doors that enter one into eternal life and one into eternal punishment. And you have provided, Father, the way through Jesus, your Son. And Father, we thank you for the grace and mercy that you show us. We thank you for the calling that you have wooed us to you, and Father, you have saved us. Our part is confession, repentance, and surrender. And so, Father, I thank you for the body called Hope. Thank you for these listening online this morning. I thank you for these that might watch in future days this particular sermon and service. Father, I just pray your Holy Spirit would move. Help us to be obedient to the standards that you have given us in our walk with you. But also, Father, help us to proclaim and live out that so that others may come to know you. Use us, Father, as you see fit. That is part of the mission that we have as believers. is to share this good news, this way, Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Father, there is no other way that leads to life eternal. So we give you thanks as we walk with you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.